Good morning and welcome to the morning session on the future of U.S. engagement in the Middle East. My name is Chaim Malka. I'm the Deputy Director and a Senior Fellow at the Middle East Program at CSIS. I'm delighted to be here this morning. As you can see, I'm stepping in for my boss, John Alterman, who was supposed to be moderating this panel. Unfortunately, John uh, got delayed, uh, his flight got delayed this morning by the volcanic ash cloud. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've never been so excited about volcanic ash in my life. Uh, so this is uh, wonderful to be here uh, sharing the stage with, with two very distinguished speakers. What we're trying to do this morning, what we're going to be looking at, is a few years down the road, looking at the inevitable changes that are going to be going on in the Middle East with the drawdown of U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, and how that's going to affect the future of U.S. engagement in the Middle East. I can't think of two better strategic thinkers uh, to work through some of these issues with us today, and I'm delighted uh, that they're here with us. General ben Brent Scowcroft is former National Security Advisor, someone who really guided U.S. foreign policy through a time of great uncertainty and change in the world and in the Middle East after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think he's really one of the great strategic thinkers of our time, and I'm delighted uh, that you're here with us. Mr. David Ignatius, who many of you know as a novelist and Hollywood screenwriter, is, <laughs> is also a columnist with the Washington Post, and I think someone who, one of the most informed uh, and, and insightful commentators on U.S. foreign policy today, and especially U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East today. Uh, so I'm delighted to see so many people here, delighted that our distinguished speakers are with us. We'll start off uh, with General Scowcroft, then we'll turn to Mr. Ignatius. I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. So, General Scowcroft, please. Well, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, uh, and I'm glad to be here with uh, uh, screenwriter David Ignatius. Uh, among his many other accomplishments, uh, he wrote a book that Big Brzezinski and I put our names on, uh, so uh, we're very close colleagues. The Middle East topic that we're focusing on, that is what happens down the road after we've left Iraq and Afghanistan, to me is a fascinating one because our, our approach toward Iraq has been unusual from the very beginning, but now it's unusual in the sense that it almost seems that when our last troops are out of Iraq, Iraq just disappears. Uh, there, there's no particular thought what happens down the line, uh, how does it fit in with the rest of the region or anything. We're there, when we're there, Iraq's important. When we're gone, uh, we, don't even, we don't even think about it. it uh, we, we may be in the most critical aspect of Iraq right now. And that is that while the security situation, besides all the horrors you read in the daily paper about suicide bombings and so on, the security situation is getting better and the Iraqi military is now increasingly able to handle the security situation. The political situation is different, however there are still sharp divisions among the groups and within some of the groups. And they are now, following election, in the process of trying to accommodate, to divide and share power. And that is a very difficult process, even in, even in our own country. But if it takes place, within what I would call a general embrace of a U.S. presence. It seems to me it's more likely to take place in a process of accommodation and political discourse. But if it hasn't happened by the time the U.S. troops leave, then it's more likely to turn into a zero-sum game with brutality and force determining the outcome. Uh, that, would be, that would be unfortunate after all of the sacrifices 
made to produce a better Iraq. Now, one of the things that is permanent about Iraq is that it is one of the fracture zones in the region. The fracture zones are both ethnic, cultural, and religious. And to its east is Iran, a Shiite country, many of whose principal shrines are in Iraq. To its west is the Arab world, Sunni versus Persian, and they meet in Iraq. So Iraq is going to be a cockpit for the evolution of these contending influences. Last but not least, of course, is the Kurdish situation. Uh, a large portion of Kurdish people live in Iraq. Some live in Syria. A number live in in uh, Turkey, and a number in Iran. The Kurds have always thought that they're a large enough culture that they deserve a, a state of their own, uh, a situation not desired by any of the countries which harbor Turkish populations, or which harbor Kurdish populations. So this is a very complex, difficult region. It needs nurturing, and that nurturing, I think, can best take place in the context of a general security resolution of the problems which beset both Sunni versus Shia and Persian versus Arab. Afghanistan is a little different. If we weren't in Afghanistan right now, we almost certainly would not be going in. We're in Afghanistan in part because uh, President Obama campaigned about getting forces out of Iraq. But so he wasn't accused of being a weakling he said, the place we need to be is Afghanistan. That's where, that's where our interests are, without perhaps understanding the nature of those interests. Our interests are in Afghanistan, but I think that they are there for two reasons. First of all, it was the proximate source of the Trade Center bombings because it was a haven for Al-Qaeda for training, equipping, so on. Uh, it is also the neighbor to Pakistan, which is a key country in the region for us and for everyone else. Pakistan has a very difficult history. When India split up, Pakistan became one of the two, one of the then three portions, uh, a more difficult portion, more tribal in nature, uh, terrain facilitating separatism, making unity difficult. And Pakistan has had enormous difficulties with democracy. India inherited the Congress Party, which was the glue that helped India evolve into a more homogenous country. Uh, Pakistan didn't enjoy that. And they've had a series of, of civilian democratic governments, which for one reason or another have failed. The military has taken over four times, sort of straightened things out, turned it back to civilian. It's a very troubled history, and it continues on that course. 
the relationship between India and Pakistan is tense, to say the least. Uh, it is improving again now, but another Mumbai incident could be a catastrophe for everyone. And Pakistan is not just another little isolated state. It's 180 million people having nuclear weapons has been a focus of conflict with India for influence between India and China and a catastrophe there could be one that would involve many of the great powers of, of the world. Uh, Pakistan and the tribal areas where we're focusing much of our attention in Afghanistan also have a unique history because many of those tribal areas were used by the Pakistani military as irregulars to foment trouble uh, in Kashmir against the Indians. So this is, a, this is a very complex situation. And right now, we're trying to unravel it by solving the Afghan part of that border region, which is largely ungoverned. I think we've made one great development in, in Afghanistan, and that is we've changed our tactics from counterterrorism to counterinsurgency. Now, that may sound pretty esoteric, but it basically means that counterterrorism, if you see a bad guy, you go after him and you take him out. And if you kill some civilians, it's too bad, but it's collateral damage. If your goal is counterinsurgency and you have the same situation, you don't take out the bad guy because the trouble you create by killing the civilians is greater than the benefits you get by taking out the bad guy. So we have changed that, and that is basically our objective in Afghanistan, and that is to give the Afghan people a sense of relative stability and security. We don't need an Afghan state, which is a modern nation state, uh, we'd be delighted if we could go back to the old days, 30 or 40 years ago, when there was a king of Afghanistan who presided over a loose collection of political and economic entities. So that's basically our goal. We're on the, I think we're on the right track. Is it enough? Our job really is to provide the locals a sense of security. Because previously, what we would do is go in and clean out villages and then leave. Well, as soon as we left, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, would come back in, kill all the people who supported us, and preside over a, a reign of terror. So we're clearing out areas, and we're holding them. But we don't have the troops to hold them forever. We have to turn them over to the Afghan military, which is now insufficient in, in size and training to do it. So we have to train the Afghan military to do it. The other aspect of it is the political influence from Kabul. In many of these areas, Kabul is seen as, as bad in many ways as the Taliban not terrorizing necessarily, but corrupt, so on. So we need Kabul to appear to be helping, not a part of the oppression of the locals. That takes a Kabul government. Karzai is in Washington, even as we speak. Uh, we've had a troubled history with him. Uh, but he is the president of Afghanistan. And I think that is what we're trying to put together. If it all comes out right, Afghanistan will be a tolerable situation. And a tolerable situation is all 
that we need in the region. It won't end our problems with Pakistan, but that's not of our, part of our subject today. Thank you for that uh, very clear overview of, of the complexities of the region. Mr. Ignatius? Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Haim for his introduction. After 30 years of writing about foreign policy, it's so nice to be uh, lumped in with uh, Hollywood, you know, to have people ask you, <laughs> David, what's Leonardo DiCaprio really like? <laughs> um, and if you want to uh, know the answer to that, you'll have to see me afterwards. Um, to, to talk about foreign policy and our, our subjects like Brent, I'm going to talk a little bit about Iraq and a little bit about Af Afghanistan. Watching the, the process in Iraq through these uh, painful uh, seven years now um, has, has taught me many lessons, but I, I think the, the number one lesson is that there's a, an enormous difference between a really bad outcome and a just sort of bad outcome, an acceptably, tolerably bad outcome. And I'd say that's what we've, we've ended up with. We have uh, still a, a weak uh, Iraqi state, uh, internal division, risk of, of sectarian violence. Uh, but it's not the total flaming uh, disaster that it would have been uh, had we left in 2006. Uh, when the country really was pitching toward a civil war. I think historians 50 years from now will, will, will note uh, two people who, who got it right about Iraq. Uh, the first uh, is sitting on my right. Uh, Brent Scowcroft warned very clearly about the dangers of invading Iraq in 2002, primarily focusing on the question of what would fill the vacuum that we would create. And he was prescient and courageous in stating the dilemmas that we ended up seeing. Uh, I'm going to say something that a lot of people disagree with now, but I think another person who will get credit from historians, uh, not for having gotten it right in the first instance about invading Iraq, um, is George Bush, who saw that uh, if he pulled out, as virtually everyone was urging him to do in this very painful 2006, 2007 uh, time frame when we would have left behind a, a country just spinning apart. Um, had, had he done that, um, we, we, would, we would be looking at a much worse situation. And I have to say, uh, I do admire Bush for uh, finding an alternative policy, for finding in General Petraeus somebody who could carry it out. And so I think we end up um, with a situation in Iraq that, for all the difficulties, uh, is, is a lot better than the really terrible outcome that we would have been looking at. So that, that's my starting point. As I look at Iraq following their March elections, I'm struck by the good sense of Iraqi voters. Uh, so often, uh, betting on, on the good sense of People uh, around, the, around the world is, is, you know, doesn't pay off. But in this case, uh, we saw Iraqis who in the first set of elections in 2005 had basically voted a sectarian ticket. Uh, there had been the big uh, Shiite parties formed together in an alliance that was uh, backed by Iran, explicitly religious. Uh, uh, people, Americans who ought to have known better, talked back then about the 80% solution. You know, if we got the Shiites with us, if we got the Kurds with us, meh, you know, basically forget about the rest. That was part of the, the arrogance of our policy back then that got us into so much trouble. But in these elections, in, in, in March 2010, Iraqis voted in surprising numbers for uh, Cross-sectarian tickets, the most striking example is the Iraqia coalition headed by Ayad Lawi, the former interim prime minister, uh, which won the largest number of seats to the surprise of everyone, most of all to the surprise of the Iranians, who had uh, waged a major, basically all-out campaign, we would call it a political covert action, uh, pumping money into the parties, candidates, uh, that they favored. Vice President Biden told me in an interview on the record that I published in my column 
that uh, he estimated, our government estimates, that Iranian spending in support of its political allies in this election was over $100 million. So that's the kind of money that the Iranians spent to try to shape this election. And guess what? It backfired. You know, it, they basically got clobbered. Uh, the, the people they supported ended up doing far worse <coughs> than was expected. Um, Iraqis ended up resenting the fact that some of these candidates had Iranian support. So the Iranians have been trying ever since to, to repair their, their situation. Um, it, it does look as if, uh, I have to be careful about making predictions, but this uh, long period of political jockeying uh, it, it, prior to formation of a new government um, is beginning to bend, I think, towards some um, uh, a, agreement. I think the Iranians and their, and their allies are acceding to the, uh, the need to get a government that Iraqis are really demanding. Um, and so they're backing off of a, what was another push to disqualify a whole set of, uh, of, of, of candidates. I'd say one thing about the U.S. role in this Iraq that we are leaving. We're pulling out most of our troops. We're pulling out this enormous amount of uh, military equipment that we, that, we, that we brought in. But we shouldn't think that that investment that we made in, in the future of Iraq, in a stable Iraq, doesn't give us the, the right and really the, the obligation to speak up about what we see as a proper course in Iraq. I, I sometimes worry that you know, we're so, as Brent said, we're so happy to be on our way out of there that we basically, you know, the, the line in Washington is zip it. You know, that's it. Uh, don't want to talk about it, don't want to think about it, don't want to deal with it. You know, uh, uh, farewell, Iraq. Uh, it's understandable given the, the, all of the, the difficulties our country has faced, all the problems that we've caused, to be honest, for Iraq and for Iraqis. But I think you know, that really gives us even more of an obligation to speak up when we see things uh, going wrong. And I, I, think, I think what that means is senior U.S. officials, Vice President Biden has been given responsibility for this, need to make clear what we see as red lines. Uh, for, for going forward, think, you know, outcomes that we think are appropriate given uh, Iraq's constitution, its, its regional interests, its security interests, and, and things we think are unacceptable. Uh, that, that doesn't mean jumping back in and waging new military offensives. It just means understanding that we have a lot of power to shape outcomes there and that we shouldn't be afraid to, 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 to speak out. I think General Odierno. Um, has done a magnificent job in subtly, quietly using his power and the confidence that Iraqis have in him uh, to shape, shape outcomes in this period immediately after the election. There are a lot of things that still are kind of murky, but I think the, the record will show that General Odierno was really smart in what he did. Uh, he, his replacement, General Austin, is coming in. He's a experienced, a strong figure, but I hope he does some of the, some of the same. Just a, a brief word about Afghanistan. Um, a, as I, I tried to say with Iraq, I think that we need to understand that our goal there, President Obama's goal, is to escape a really terrible outcome. And understand that that doesn't mean we're going to have a really good outcome. I, I don't think that we are. We're going to have an acceptably bad outcome. We're going to have a country that's ragged. We're going to have Afghan security forces that aren't really ready to do the job. Um, but we will have made it a lot better than it, than it would have been had we, had we bailed out of this project. Um, and I think, I think President Obama's decision will be, will be judged to have been a, to have been a sound one. Uh, as, as I look at the situation this week, I'm struck by a couple of things. First, you would have thought that U.S. government officials would have learned by now something that General Scowcroft always exhibited when he was in government, which is that it's wise when you're dealing with other countries, especially with your allies, to make your criticisms in private. You know, especially in, in parts of the world where, where public dignity and, and, the, and, and the humiliation that comes from being criticized in public are such important things. Uh, and I, I think that US officials uh, are, are, are 
talented special envoy for Afghanistan, Pakistan, Richard Holbrook, our defense secretary, one of the best uh, secretaries of defense we've had in a long time. Uh, most recently, our, our uh, smart, experienced national security advisor have all made a big boo-boo in publicly criticizing Karzai uh, and, and in some instances all doing the same thing with Pakistani officials in ways that virtually guarantee a bad outcome. I mean, you know, it's just people are going to have to show that they're independent. If you take them down in public, they're going to they're bite you back. And so I, I think this piece of theater we've been watching in Washington this week, I'll be cynical and describe it as that, in which we've had this public embrace of President Obama and President Karzai, is, is an elaborate attempt to repair damage that was self-inflicted by us. We, we didn't need to, to, to make the criticism so so emphatic in public. It created a problem we're now having to repair. I hope it's, it's repaired. We don't have, effectively, an alternative to Karzai. He knows that. We know that. Let's get on with it. Um, a, a final thought about Afghanistan. I have to be honest and say that I think, so far, this strategy of President Obama's, which I, I said I thought was a good one, uh, is having difficulties in the field. The first big test of it in Helmand province in a, in a rural area called Marja, where I was at the end of March, initially looked pretty successful. You know, Marines went in, bang, bang, they cleared the area. They had a fabulous Brigadier General uh, uh, Nicholson who just, you know, gives the best interview you ever saw. And, you know, everybody was going, you know, there, well, that just shows we can get, get the job done. Uh, Ninety days later, Marja is still um, insecure. The Taliban has not been cleared from all areas of Marja, despite this enormous uh, offensive by U.S. Marines and what, what looked like success. And worse, uh, the, the uh, whole point of this exercise was to get local governance in Marja uh, that would be part of a process of transition to Afghan control. And that's really not working, from what I hear. The officials haven't gotten there for the most part. When they do get there, they can't travel around because it's not secure. Uh, they, they just, uh, the pieces of that have not come together. So we need to be honest about that and try to fix it while there's still time. Uh, and the, the, the second thing that I, I'm struck by looking at Kandahar, but also looking at dealing with President Karzai in, in, in Kabul, is that when it comes to the political side of this, which is the most important, we still aren't sure what to do. Uh, I, was, I was in Kandahar at the end of March. I sat in a shura in which all the local big shots who were resented by a lot of the ordinary folks in Kandahar sat around and basically t said, you know, over our dead bodies are you going to change things? These aren't Taliban. These are our friends. You know, and they're basically saying the way we're dividing up the spoils where our tribe and our friends get all the goodies, you know, that's the way we're going to do it. And if you try to mess with that, you've got, and I think we've looked at that and we've realized if you knock that whole power structure over, as much as it's resented by people uh, in Kandahar City and Kandahar District, you're going to create a vacuum into which will flow, you don't know. And so I think people are being very, very careful about upsetting the apple cart. You know, and that's, you know, I think they're, they're, they're trying to be prudent uh, uh, appropriately. So I don't think Kandahar is going to work out smoothly or easily. So, you know, the two key tests that were going to happen this year for our Afghanistan policy, I have to be honest and say, I don't think they're going very well. So I think we're going to end up next July with a ragged situation. And my hope will be, and I'll close here, that it will be just a little bad. You know, it will be acceptably bad. It won't be flaming all out terrible uh, because, you know, I, I've learned to think that's, that's going to be my metric. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. Thank you for that difficult yet honest assessment of the situation. Uh, I want to pose a question to you, General Scorecroft, uh, to start off with. You mentioned that the region needs a lot of nurturing right now. There are a lot of fault lines, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Arab, uh, Arab, Israeli. Is the U.S in a position to give the nurturing, to, to nurture the region in, in, in a way, in an effective way? Are we capable of that now? I, I think we are. I think we're in a, a unique position to do it. And that brings in uh, uh, a state which is not a part of our discussion, Iran. Uh, 
Iran has borders on both of the areas that we've been talking about where we have troops. Are we discussing with Iran the nature of the region? No. Iran's going to be there long after we're gone. And it seems to me, however profound our differences, a discussion with Iran on Iraq and the future of Iraq and the future of Afghanistan is critical to any kind of a resolution of the region. Now, in the early days of Afghanistan, we did have dialogue with Iran on the borders of the Afghan conflict. And then with acts and evil, other things, that, that broke down. So it seems to me one of the things we need to do in dealing with the Iranian problem is to recognize that Iran itself is in a difficult region, beset by these different kinds of fracture lines, and that we ought to seek a solution which accommodates as best one can in a very turbulent region uh, those problems. Can, can you give us some examples of how we might include Iran in that kind of a framework that you suggest? Well, the future of Iraq, for example. What should be the future of Iraq? How do, how do we want Iraq to secure its place in the region? We, we've been so concentrated on a Saddam Hussein in the region that it's sort of distorted. That, but you, you go back 20 years or so, Iran and Iraq fought a seven-year war here. Our original policy after we replaced the British in that whole area was to build strength in Iran as the pacifier for the region. When the Shah left, it was a balance between Iran and Iraq, so we didn't have to keep forces there. Those are the kinds of things we need to start thinking about again. Uh, how can we produce a region which tends toward stability rather than toward chaos? And I don't have all the answers, but we need to start focusing on that rather than on the residual problems of the past. Let me ask you, David Ignatius, you mentioned that Iran was surprised by the outcome of the uh, Iraqi elections. Are we in the U.S. having an honest debate about Iran's role in the region and, and Iran's influence in the region, especially in light of drawdowns, expected drawdowns in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, I, I think um, this Iranian regime and its, uh, its president, uh, Ahmadinejad, do everything they can to make themselves toxic um, to uh, deter anybody who'd like to do what um, Brent describes, and, and what I agree in principle makes sense. Um, I said a nice thing about the, the Bush administration in 2006 a moment ago. Now I'm going to make a, a very critical comment. One of the biggest mistakes that they made was that in March of 2006, uh, after a lot of internal debate in Tehran, uh, the uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei decided to send uh, his most trusted representative, really, Ali Larajani, to Iraq for high-level strategic dialogue with the United States about stabilizing Iraq, where, in fact, Iranian and U.S. interests uh, at that time, and arguably still, are pretty similar. We want to stabilize Iraq under the existing Shiite-led government. Um, the U.S. had invited these talks. We had been, you know, uh, sending signals that we, we'd loved Iranian help in stabilizing Iraq. So the Iranians decided to take us up on it and sent, uh, proposed to send Larajani. I happened to be in Baghdad on the day that that was announced. It was orchestrated with our friends in the Shiite alliance, uh, Abdul Aziz Hakim and others. And no sooner had the Iranians announced that they were doing this than the U.S. Um, s basically said, no, we're not playing. We panicked, and the reason we panicked was that Larjani was so high level, we were afraid that our, the nuclear issue would get swallowed up in a discussion about Iraq. 
Uh, I was in Tehran in, in October, in, uh, in August and September of that year, and I went to see one of the hardliners who runs a newspaper there called Kehan. And he said, uh, you know, I tried to warn uh, Ayatollah Khamenei not to send his representative to Baghdad. I said, this is an American trick. They're not serious about working with us about Iraq. And you know, I was right. And we'll never make that mistake again. And I thought, boy, what a missed opportunity that was. Um, so I, you know, so is the opportunity still there to have a dialogue with Iran about stabilizing the region? Yes. Is, is the long run goal for wise US policy in the broadest strategic sense, a new security architecture for the Gulf and the adjacent regions that draws in Iran as a rising power, uh, the, the, the reality of whose, whose power, cultural weight, uh, historical importance can't be, shouldn't be ignored. Is, is, is that what we should be trying to do in the long run? Absolutely. Does this White House understand this? this? Yes. I mean, that was the whole point that President Obama made in talking uh, really from his first day about engagement with Iran. That was not popular um, universally, but he said we're going to make every effort we can to en engage this country, draw it into strategic dialogue with this goal that I just described uh, in mind of a new regional security architecture. And basically, he's gotten nothing for it. He sent two private letters to the Supreme Leader. There have been lots of efforts through many different channels to communicate our interest in a serious dialogue, and it's gone nowhere. So what do we do now? And I, you know, for, for that, I, I'm, not, I'm just a journalist, so I turn to people yeah. like General Scowcroft. <laughs> well, General Scowcroft, let's, let's pick up on that point. I mean, future Gulf security environment where you have a, a greater Iranian presence, how do you think our Gulf allies and the GCC states view that sort of a structure? And, and do you think they, they worry about the future U.S. commitment to their region? I don't know if they worry about our commitment. I think they worry about the region. And uh, in the Gulf area, they're very concerned about Iran and the spreading of Iranian influence, both because of the religion and because of the, uh, the cultural differences. Uh, but they're not about to join in an alliance with the United States against Iran at the present time, because that would be immensely unpopular in the streets of the region. Uh, can we do it? I don't, I don't know, because I think David touched on a, on a very important point, and that is however much we try to have an enlightened policy toward Iran, it's very difficult to know who to talk to. And from the Iranian perspective, I think there's a great fear in talking to anybody because you can be accused by <coughs> other factions in Iran of selling out to the great Satan. So we have a huge problem here. The structure of the Iranian state is a theocracy. And so the mullahs are titularly the final arbiters. There is a government run by a president, Ahmadinejad, elected, so on and so forth. But those, the laws that they pass can be invalidated by the mullahs and so on. So there are those two. And then there is the coercive power of the state in the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard who control the situation. Now, theoretically, they're controlled by the mullahs as well. Are they? Uh, in the turmoil since the last Iranian elections, it seems to me, and, and David has a much better vantage point than I to look at it, that the mullahs have lost authority. Ahmadinejad Probably the government has lost some authority. And the chief beneficiaries of the situation since then have been the Revolutionary Guard, who more and more are the controllers of internal Iran. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. 
But let's suppose we decide we want to sit down with Iran and have a discussion about the whole region, the ideal situation. Who do you talk to? Can you talk to anybody? That's not at all clear. David Ignatius, are, are there tools that we might have at our disposal that we're not using to try to raise the cost or raise the price uh, for the Iranians to pursue their nuclear program? Or is it inevitable that Iran, like North Korea, like Pakistan and India, will become a nuclear power? Well, that, that's the, the toughest question that this administration faces uh, going forward. Um, I often, in sessions like this, quote a comment uh, by my friend Graham Allison at the uh, Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government, who has said that the U.S.-Iranian uh, nuclear confrontation is the Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. And um, I think we all have a grim sense of what Graham means, that, that this is, you know, it goes forward so slowly, but we are on a course for confrontation. Absent some change, absent some diplomatic some solution, some way of, of increasing pressure to a point that's unacceptable for Iran, so Iran changes course, thinking of that, that analogy, the, the ships stop and then turn around and take the missiles back to, back to, back to Russia. Um, you know, absent that, we, we are on a course toward military conflict, initiated by us, initiated by Israel, initiated by Iran, who can say? That would be a disastrous outcome. The last thing this country needs is another war in that part of the world. I think it's really, really important that we find an alternative to that. So, Haim, to, to speak directly to your, to your question, I, I'm in a mood where I, I, I want to look um, not at the, at the bright side, but at the, at the, at the, at the, at the you know, the, the often more likely um, negative outcomes. So I want to assume that somewhat stronger sanctions will be enacted and that they will, they will fail. They will be no more successful in stopping this program than previous sanctions have been. So what lies between the failure of additional sanctions and the opening of military conflict? What are the options in that space? And how do we get ready to operate in that space, because that's where we're going to be pretty soon. I, you know, I couldn't say when, but that's where we're going to be, I think. Uh, there are all kinds of things that I can think about. They're, they're probably you know, best expressed in private, because um, uh, they're really complicated options. Um, but um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example just to, just to think about. Uh, in, in 2007, uh, Israel uh, became concerned about uh, the discovery that Syria was building a nuclear reactor in secret, contrary to all understandings. Uh, the U.S. also was aware of this. There was disagreement about what the best way to deal with this was. Um, one night, that reactor was just taken out. Uh, there was no public claim of credit. There was no um, comment. There was no uh, patting on the back. And there was a denial by the, the Syrian government that it had ever been a reactor in the first place. And indeed, uh, it was plowed under. Some other structure was erected. And, and so the Syrians are so uh, uh, you know, deep into that version of events that they don't want to come. So um, I mention that because it was widely predicted uh, among the few in the, uh, widely, it was, it was predicted by the few in the government who really were following this carefully, that, that bombing that reactor could produce a regional war with devastating consequences. That didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? You know, what was the combination of factors that led to the desired outcome? No more reactor, no war. Is that in any way a useful guide to the future? I don't know, but it's one of the things I'm thinking about. There are a lot of issues on the table, and I think I'll, I'll stop monopolizing this conversation and open it up to the audience. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. We have two microphones, uh, and we also have some questions that are coming in over the internet that we might... Uh... Thank you. It's on its way. Um, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I want to ask about American attitudes 
and, and the attitude that somehow we have the right to go overseas and tell people what kind of government they ought to be running. It seems to me that's a very hard thing to do today. Um, how do you start educating them that perhaps that's not the only alternative to dealing with some of these problems? Uh, and I guess the other thing that I think they need to understand is change is slow. And we are so accustomed to quick turnover of technology, but it takes generally two generations to get change within a human setting. So how do you educate people to understand that? So th their expectations line up with what it is we can deliver and not get forced into doing things because they're impatient. Who wants to take that? Well, let me, uh, hi, Mitzi. Um, so, uh, let me take the, the first of your observations, which I think is a, is a really uh, important one. People don't like being told what to do. They don't like it if they're Americans. We resent it um, enormously when other people try to tell us what to do, and they don't like it uh, if they're uh, Pakistanis, Afghans, uh, you name it. Um, I think one of the achievements of this president he has a mixed record in foreign policy. But I think one of the real achievements that he's made is that he has um, taken us down from the bully pulpit. If you look at the polling numbers that register international opinion about the United States, it, there's a striking change since Obama became president. I last night had dinner with a Russian uh, businessman who's visiting who knows that regime well, and he said, you know, your president's pretty popular in Russia today. Uh, even though President Bush in many ways was much closer to, to Vladimir Putin than, than Obama is to Medvedev, Russians like Obama. They think he's not trying to push us around. They think he respects our, our dignity, our, our rights. You know, I was, I was fascinated by that. The, the numbers show similar reactions around the world. So I think we have a president who just in terms of his body language, the way he speaks, seems less like somebody telling you off, telling you what to do. Um, I think sometimes President Bush you know, couldn't help it. He didn't mean to, to sound so uh, didactic, but it came across that way. And even people who should have liked him, I was all struck by you know, Egyptians. President Bush was, you know, he was fighting for the Egyptian uh, man or woman in the street, but it didn't help him in terms of his popularity in Egypt. Can I ask you to continue, or maybe General Scowcroft, you can jump in on that. I agree with you that there's a lot of, Obama is very popular in that sense. He's, he's tried to reach out. He's tried to heal relations with uh, the Muslim world. But to what extent do you, th do you think that that's also seen in some quarters of the world as weakness, as American weakness? The U.S. is, uh, is tied down in Iraq and Afghanistan, has a lot of security uh, obligations. Is, is that outreach and engagement, the softer side, uh, of, of the U.S. message viewed as weakness at all? I'd love to know what Brent thinks about uh, that. No, I don't, I don't really think so. I think that uh, uh, we have frequently interpreted that way, that uh, the United States has been too wishy-washy, and we need to get out and we need to lead. And if you remember some of the slogans from the recent past, if you're not with us, you're against us. Uh, you know, either follow us or get out of the way, all of those things. And I think that, that contributed to a sense of hubris that the rest of the world ascribed to the United States. Hi, let me say just one thing. Um, in the book that, um, that Brett uh, mentioned, which was called America and the World, Conversations About the Future of Foreign Policy, in which, in which General Scowcroft and Zbigniew Brzezinski, a prominent Republican, a prominent Democrat, both former national security advisors, talk with me just basically you know, asking questions in the middle huh. uh, about, where, about, where, about where foreign policy was going. And both of them made, and I think this was the central um, analytical point of this book, both of them made the point that, that the world is in the midst of a kind of revolution um, in terms of attitudes. Um, General Scowcroft spoke about a yearning for dignity around the world. 
uh, that people just felt that they, 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 it was a kind of new wave, it's like the post-colonial period, but a kind of coming back, and, and, and this, this great ferment. And somehow the U.S. had to get our policy aligned with that reality of the world. So we were going in the same direction as that, rather than seeming to, to try to stop it and check it. And I thought it was a really powerful point. I think that book was carefully read. Um, General Scowcross and uh, Spig's arguments were, were carefully followed by this White House. And I think that they've had some success in that. And that's not, you know, I mean, you know, we always talk about smart power. Smart power is aligning your interests with, you know, the way the world is going. So that, you know, you're on the same train and you're kind of going to get to the same place together and not fighting wars the whole way. And I think that that's been a smart thing they've tried to do, not a weak thing. I, I think one of the differences is, you know, we pride ourselves on solving problems. And so we go into an area, whether it's, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Iraq, wherever it is, we want to straighten it out. And if it doesn't straighten out, it's got to be because the local leaders are wrong. Well, we have a fantastically bad record of changing <laughs> leaders and improving the situation. And I think, historically, I think that really goes back to the post-World War II period, when we picked up a devastated Europe and put it back together again. And we think, that's us. We can do that. The difference is, Europe was just fractured. And all you had to do was let it reconstruct itself. The people were there. They knew how to do it, so on. We're dealing with cultures now that are fundamentally different. And we have to recognize that this is, as David said, this is a very different and slow process. And we can't appear to direct it. We have to encourage it. And that's sort of non-American. <laughs> <laughs> I see another question over there. Hi, Mary Louise Kelly, along with NPR and now shifting over to Georgetown University. Question, as we're talking about fault lines in the Middle East, there's of course no greater one than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I wonder how the two of you rate the Obama administration's efforts so far in that arena. Do you expect to see, should we expect to see greater engagement or they've got, obviously got a lot of foreign policy problems on their plate, are they gonna leave it at the current level of engagement, do you think? Well, thank you, David. <laughs> He'll get his turn. I, I personally think we have a historic opportunity in the Palestinian issue at the present time, uh, which we have yet to seize. Uh, I believe that if you look around this troubled world, uh, with all the problems it faces, that the U.S. faces in the world, that there's no single issue that this president could take hold of and produce greater effect than the Palestinian peace process. Because it psychologically infects the entire region. And Iran plays on it, not only through Hezbollah and Hamas, whose very raison d'etre is the Palestinian process, but this sense of injustice that, that they turn into hatred against the great Satan. So psychologically, it would be a tremendous step. Uh, and I think that if President Obama would fought would follow up on his Cairo speech, which almost instilled a sense of euphoria in the region. Here's a guy who understands us, who wants to help us, to say, it is time now. The end of the Clinton administration had set forth the parameters of a settlement in the Middle East. It didn't happen because Clinton left office. Arafat was reluctant. The Arabs weren't there to support for a variety of reasons. It collapsed. But it represents a kind of consensus on what the solution is. 
And if President Obama would say, we believe that these Taba Accords of 2000 represent the right framework for a discussion of a settlement, and we support them, we would certainly get support from the Europeans, probably from the Russians and the UN, thus the quartet supporting. And I think it could dramatically change the situation in the whole region. Uh, instead, <coughs> the administration started out with what I would call a repetition of confidence building measures. The Israelis stopped settlements and the Arabs provide some steps toward normalization. Well, to me, that's going after the capillaries, not the jugular. Uh, and it was almost doomed to fail, because why would the Israelis stop settlements? And what would that do for the Arabs? Because they thought the Israelis had agreed to stop settlements 30 years ago. So that has bogged down, and now we're on proximity talks, which is a step away from where we started out. And uh, so I guess I would say that a dramatic step by the president who said, this is what the United States believes is a fair and equitable solution, and we think it ought to be the basis for negotiations by the parties, would be a dramatically positive step. I, I think uh Brent said it uh, just right. I think that that's right. I think that um, we'll see. They're they're trying to make a, 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 a last effort with the, the incremental uh, proximity talks approach, uh, with you could say the veiled uh, threat uh, that if you don't if you don't do this, we are prepared. You know, we might listen to that General Scowcroft, <laughs> and uh, we might you know we might come to the t table with our own set of principles. So you better get moving. And we'll see if that produces any progress. I think it probably won't. And I think the dilemma in the fall uh, will, will be the one that, uh, that, that Brent describes. And I, th I think uh, he, he, he's right. This, this does seem to be a conflict that the parties on their own are not able to resolve. And if you think it's in Israel's security interest vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis Hamas, vis-a-vis -vis all of the enemies that surround Israel, to find some way to, to get some kind of settlement here, as I do, um, then I think some more active U.S. role now is appropriate. Make it, just to make the linkage uh, between the Arab-Israeli issue and, and, and Iran again, which has come up into the public debate quite a bit, uh, do you believe that the Israelis are capable of making the strategic compromises on peace before they know how the Iran issue will be settled? Oh yes, I don't. I don't think these are mutually exclusive. Uh, Israel considers its existential threat right now to be Iran, and it would like the region to focus on the Iranian problem, and thinks that the Arab states are a natural ally in dealing with the Iranian situation, and that is theoretically true. But it it overlooks this gaping void of the Palestinian issue, which is existential with the Arab side. So, you know, the Bush 43 administration tried to get a coalition together to deal with, with Iran, the Arabs, Israel, the United States. It didn't work, and, 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 it, and it won't work because of the Arab hang up on the Palestinian issue. I see a lot of other hands out there. Yes, sir, in the middle. Can you wait for the microphone? It's on its way. Hi, uh, Michael Davis with Universal Human Rights Network. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what impact you think a politically stable Iraq will have um, in the larger region. Specifically, I'm thinking of Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Well, I'll take a crack at that. If you, if you had a political stable, politically stable Iraq that was a functioning democracy, I think the, the impact would be enormous. Um, 
uh, when I, last time I was in Baghdad, or one time last year when I was there, I was sitting talking with two um, Iraqi friends who were having a heated conversation about uh, whether Prime Minister Maliki should be dumped or not. Um, and, you know, one was saying, Maliki's a disaster, you know, this, this man must be voted out, you know, and he listed two or three other alternative prime ministers. No, 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 Maliki's done much better than you're saying. And I thought to myself, I can't imagine this conversation taking place anywhere else, you know, arguably with the exception of Lebanon, um, in, the, in the Arab world. And um, so that's what the, the promise that Iraq offers. Uh, Iraq is, uh, you know, to, to everyone's surprise, kind of a functioning democracy right now. And uh, they, they're, all, they're on the verge of blowing it and, you know, demanding recounts and throwing candidates out, but they seem to kind of get it together at the last minute um, again and again. Egypt is facing a transition that really matters. I mean, e Egypt is still the, the biggest country, the heart of the Arab world, as we, as we always used to say. And we're begin we have to think now about the post-Mubarak era and how's that transition going to go? And are we, uh, do, we, do we have uh, radical Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, pressure against the regime? And uh, I, I don't want to say there's a direct connection between, between Baghdad and Cairo on this, but I, but, I, but I do think that people in the Middle East are sort of struck by the fact that the elections are, are, are a pretty good thing, and they, and they watch Al Jazeera, they watch Al Arabiya, and they, and they see this very lively political debate in Iraq, and they're, I mean, so far as I know, talking to my friends, they're struck by it. So that's, that's a good thing. I don't want to overstate the, the linkage, but I think that there is a little bit. I, if, if I can just add, I, I, I agree with that completely. I, I think in the Middle East, not just in Egypt, there is a transition. Middle East emerged on our scene uh, with a, run by a series of strong men. Their passing, the first was King Hussein, and that transition has been successful. Now we're facing one in Egypt. We're facing one fundamentally in Saudi Arabia as well. What is the next leadership likely to be? And I think Iraq could, could play a role as an example of how that could take place. Well, this conference is streaming live on the internet, and we have some questions that came in off the internet, so I want to pose one of those to you. It's a, it's a bit of a bombshell, but where will, where will be the next crisis in the Middle East, and how will it affect U.S. interests? So you can take well, your pick. Uh, I'll, so. I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a chat at that. I think it, it's quite likely that the next crisis could be in Lebanon, and it could be precipitated by... Iran, who sees itself in a difficult position, wants to take the pressure off and stimulates an uprising by Hezbollah. Uh, it could take place uh, in, uh, in Gaza as well, which is another cauldron. This is not, one of the other reasons to press on a peace accord is this is not a placid region that will just stay and wait until we're ready to do something. Uh, a, next, a next step is almost certainly going to happen, and they're all bad, and then you have to start reconstructing all over again. You mentioned Lebanon and, and Gaza. Do you think it's in the interest of either Hezbollah or Hamas to provoke a war with Israel? And if there was uh, that kind of a war again, how do you think that would affect the U.S.? Well, I, I, this would not be provoking a war with Israel and Iran. This would be Iran through its proxies in Hezbollah and Hamas stimulating something which would fully occupy Israel, and Iran would say, what, us? I, like, like Brent, I think the top of my list would be Lebanon. Um, countries in the region uh, tend to like to, to fight their wars uh, on Lebanese territory rather than their own for understandable reasons. Um, the only hope of avoiding that is that the Lebanese are, are sick of being everybody's uh, uh, battle, battlefield uh, and exerting pressure on the, on the actors, especially Hezbollah, to, to, um, to resist that. I, I think I see no evidence that we have a Lebanese government strong enough to do that. I'll just mention one um, problem that concerns me. I don't think it's the next 
war or crisis at that level, but it's something that's not on people's radar, and I, so I want to mention, mention it. Um, one consequence of not addressing the Palestinian problem for the Netanyahu government is that as, as, as Palestinians feel more pressure in the, in the uh, occupied territories, absent a settlement, there's an inevitable tendency to move out toward Jordan. And uh, in the last several weeks, a group of retired Jordanian army officers has issued a public letter to the king, to King Abdullah, something that's quite unusual in that country, demanding that King Abdullah resist efforts to solve the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian problem at Jordan's expense. Uh, these are essentially East Bankers in the army, the traditional Bedouin core of stability in that, in that country, who were saying, you know, Netanyahu wants to make Jordan the Palestinian state. Palestinians are streaming into Jordan, uh, have a demographic majority, have increasing uh, roles in the government, um, uh, in King Abdullah's uh, government, and, and they're unhappy about it and taking this unusual step. That's just a small sign. We like, tend to think, thank goodness, of Jordan as a relatively stable island in this kind of messy uh, map. But here's, here's a sign of underlying tensions, unusual steps by important actors that if, if I were sitting in the NSC and Brent Scowcroft's old chair, I would take seriously. I agree. Yes, sir. Uh, Chet Crocker, Georgetown University. A couple of 20,000 foot questions for a retired Air Force general and a screenplay writer. <laughs> um, Brent, you mentioned the phrase a nurturing presence. And I wonder what kind of post-Iraq war post-Afghan war military footprint you see in that part of the world? And, and what, what role for our diplomacy? Uh, are we going to be the lead actor on all the issues that we've been touching on? Israel, Palestine, India, Pakistan, uh, and of course the Gulf security architecture which David mentioned. So are we going to be the lead diplomatic presence and the lead military presence in this region? And should this region continue to occupy 80% of our political and diplomatic capital around the world? Thank you. Chad, I think you're the best one to answer that question. Uh, I, I would hope that we would back down a little bit from leadership in the region to, if you will, nurturing and cooperation and encouragement uh, for the region to get itself together and to move in unison. It's fundamentally a rich region. Iraq, for example, uh, has uh, huge natural resources. The right kind of encouragement could do a lot to turn the Iraqi-Iranian relationship to one at least of toleration. I think Jordan is another problem, which is in part a regional problem. Aside from the issues of the East Bank and so on, there are close to a million Iraqi refugees in, uh, in Jordan. This is a terrible burden for a state without the natural resources that some of the others have. I think we can use our ability to organize and guide in a way which encourages the best instincts of the region without saying, we've dealt with these military problems, now we're going to set the region straight, because I don't think we're able to do that. Um. Chet, let me uh, throw out just uh, one idea that I heard recently that um, made me think of ways we can hand off some of the, the hard work here to others that, that may be more successful in, in aspects of it. Uh, uh, talking with Ashraf Ghani, the former Afghan finance minister, uh, over the last several weeks, 
prior to uh, the arrival of President Karzai, uh, he mentioned um, the interesting uh, prospect that Afghanistan may have a lot more mineral wealth uh, if conflict there ever subsides than we realize. I mean, his estimates were one to three trillion dollars uh, in copper, uh, iron ore, lithium, other strategic uh, uh, raw materials. And he argued the key to development of these resources and the key to long-run stabilization of our country may be China. Uh, as you probably know, it was the Chinese who bid on the big uh, uh, copper mine that the uh, Afghans opened, opened for, for, for bids. Um, and the Chinese agreed as part of that deal to build a, rail, a railroad into uh, Afghanistan through the northeast. They obviously can't go over the direct border because you'd have to go right over the Hi Himalayas. That would be a hell of a railroad to ride. Um, so they'll probably go through Tajikistan. But, but Ghani said something that really stuck with, stuck with me. Uh, he said, our problem is that we have been a frontier, that we have been seen strategically as a barrier to India and Pakistan. It's the way the world thought of us. And uh, we need to be not a barrier, but a transition point. And he said, think of, frontiers are always dangerous, he said. Frontiers are crazy. People are always getting these wild conflicts. And think of your own frontier, and think of what ended its status as a frontier, where people went around shooting each other. It was the railroad. Uh, it, was, it was the basic fact of economic infrastructure and development. And he said, that's going to be true for us someday. And the people who may be best positioned to, to do that are not new Americans, but the Chinese. And I found that fascinating. Really interesting idea. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, Jan Alexander, an academic. Thank you for your overview. If I may, I would like to guess uh, your reaction uh, regarding another element. We focused a lot on the Palestinian-Israeli issue. If only we can resolve it, this can make a tremendous change in the Middle East. My question is, how do you see the prospects of peace between Syria and Israel? and the bowl, for example, of Turkey in this uh, process. Thank you. Well, um, the Turkish Foreign Minister Davutoglu was just in Washington at the time of the nuclear uh, summit with his uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Davutoglu is one of the most ambitious uh, foreign ministers I, I know, um, and he is eager to restart the Turkish channel uh, for dialogue between Syria and Israel. Um, uh, he's also eager to start a channel with Iran um, and just flying back and forth to Tehran every other week. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. More important to me right now is, is the U.S.-Syria bilateral relationship. And I think it really, it really, um, you know, if there's, if there's an opportunity out there for creative diplomacy, you know, a makeable putt, to use the golf term, it strikes me that this is it. Um, every time that I go to see Bashar Assad, every time that anybody goes to visit him, he basically just can't stop telling you how eager he is for greater dialogue, that his future inevitably is looking west, not east. And I think, you know, testing that in a creative way, creative, skillful way through engagement and diplomacy makes sense. Um, this question of, of, of Syrian uh, shipment of weapons or tolerance for the shipment of weapons to Hezbollah has come up again and has, has made this more complicated. You know, that raises to me the more fundamental question of whether the tail wags the dog here. I mean, I think it's increasingly difficult for Syria to exercise control over Hezbollah. Um, but to me, that makes it more important for us to, to begin to move now uh, rather than less. I, I think that, I think that you know, Syria, the, Syria's ability to, to exercise control so that really crazy things don't happen in Lebanon 
uh, with a missile exchange and really devastating conflict. That's really important. So I'd love to see more attention. I'd like, like to see our ambassador get over there and, uh, and just see, you know, see what's possible. I couldn't tell you for sure, but I'd sure like to see it being explored more. I, I'm surprised we haven't made more progress with Syria than we have because it seems to me it's certainly in the U.S. interest. It seems to me it's in Syria's interest not to be totally hostage to Iranian foreign policy. Uh, so far, it has gone extremely slowly. I think fundamentally, though, the Syrian-Israeli problem is much more tractable than the Syrian-Palestinian problem because that, that frontier is a strategic frontier. It is not a historical, cultural frontier. And there is a solution. If you stand on the top of the Golan Heights, it's almost like you're looking straight down into Israel. So it is a strategic problem for Israel. But a demilitarized Golan Heights with uh, UN troops or somebody there is a perfectly acceptable solution, I think, to, to both sides. Uh, so I think that is something waiting to happen, and it puzzles me that it hasn't happened faster. We have time for one last question. The conference organizers made only one request to me, and that was that we end on time. So you get I'll be the quick one. then. Um, are there some lower visibility issues that the U.S. and Iran could engage in, whether, whether it be counter-narcotics at the border with Iran or piracy? And the, are there some things that could become the capacity uh, building, confidence building kinds of steps we could make without it always having to be the higher order issues of Iraq or, or the nuclear? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, think I think they probably exist. There are two separable categories. The one is Iraq and the region, which is we've been talking about. The other is Iraq with nuclear, or Iran with nuclear weapons. And I think that can be treated separately from the others. Uh, I think it would be worthwhile trying, but to me, one of the really intractable difficulties, how you talk to Iran at all. Both, you don't know what the right channel is, who are the right people, what their negotiating authority is, who they report to, and there's a reluctance of any of these groups to be seen reaching out to the great Satan because it exposes them to domestic problem. To me, that's the greater problem, but I think I think we ought to be searching for ways to deal with it. One um, starting point that's appealed to me for the last several years would address um, one area in which the U.S. and Iran are constantly uh, facing off, and that's um, incidents at sea in the Persian Gulf. Um, I think there's quite a lot of uh, interest and support uh, quiet support among our naval officers uh, for the idea of finding some way to, the model would be the incidents at sea agreement that was uh, negotiated with the Soviet Union at the height of Cold War tension, when you know we were really getting into some tricky uh, moments of, 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 of confrontation, and, and that agreement was negotiated, and it, was, it did build confidence between the militaries. I'm sure Brent was part of that process. And, you could, you could do something similar, arguably, uh, in the Gulf. One problem is that, is that um, uh, operational control over uh, coastal defenses um, of Iran in the Gulf, as I understand it, has now been given to the Revolutionary Guard naval forces, not to the regular Navy. And the Revolutionary Guard is increasingly active um, so you, it, this would really be a negotiation with the Revolutionary Guard, not with the regular military. Um, at a time when we're trying to undercut the, the Revolutionary Guard, when they're so unpopular at home, do you want to be negotiating with them? Uh, it's complicated. But that's, that's one area that people who think about this question 
uh, have focused on, and um, you know, if, if you were looking for a starting point, that would be it. So this doesn't appear to be getting any easier with the, <laughs> with the drawdown. Uh, looking you mean forward. we didn't solve all the problems? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been an incredibly enriching discussion. I've learned a lot. I'm grateful to both of you, General Scowcroft, David Ignatius, for enlightening this discussion, and uh, thank, thank you to all of you for, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. That's well done. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Thank you.